Hello, and welcome everyone to the launch of the Evidence for Gender and Education resource. I'm Erin Ganju, Managing, Managing Director of Ikhidi Giving. Um, first, I just want to note that in light of the unprecedented times we're in with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we are sincerely grateful to all of you for making the time to be with us today. And we hope that your families and your colleagues um, and yourself are all safe and healthy. Um, we are um, excited, though, to share the Evidence of Gender and Education resource, or EAGER for short, which hopefully many of you have already had a chance to explore online. We hope that this is really a new resource, um, especially during these challenging times that may be helpful to bring our global education community together and support further collaboration. So thanks for joining us. And there has been incredible interest in this new resource um, with hundreds of people joining this webinar. We also had a previous one um, a, a few weeks ago, again, with many people, and it was great to have everyone engaged. As Jennifer mentioned, please go to menti.com and use the code 996418 to answer the first question, what region are you based in? It'll be great to see the results. And while we're waiting for the results being calculated and people to continue to join us, I will introduce today's speakers. We've had an incredible partnership with the Population Council who has worked tirelessly to create EAGER. You'll hear from Stephanie, the director of the Council's Girl Innovation Research and Learning Center, aptly called Girl Center for short. Um, also from Nicole, a senior associate at the Council, and Meredith, a research analyst at the Council. We are, are also pleased to have Shohini of Breakthrough joining us, who will discuss EAGER and social norm change. And then we'll have Manjula of SIF India, who will talk about eager and evidence for the multi-component programs. And then I'll share some ways again at the end in which you can engage with eager and upcoming plans um, before we have an open Q&A. So please do um, keep your questions for Q&A or write them in the Q&A box and we'll be excited to engage around those. So let's take a look and see where everyone is coming from uh, that is joining us from the webinar now. be sharing those results and it looks like we have a um, very good uh, turnout from South Asia which is great to see. We have a number of North American members too, um, likely from the East Coast given the time zone. Um, we have many people um, globally then as well from Sub-Saharan Africa, East Asia, Latin American components. So it's great to see the global nature. Thank you so much all for joining us. Um, and so moving on, um, we at Akinna Giving have had the incredible pleasure, as I mentioned, of partnering with a POP Council to help create EAGER because our sole aim as a private funder is to support quality, gender-sensitive education for both boys and girls in lower-income countries. We've been funding work in the gender education space for over a decade, yet we still really struggle with the fundamental questions around how do we connect evidence and impact in our sector. We're continually asking ourselves, you know, do we really know what works best for girls at different stages in their education life cycle? And where was, has the world made progress in helping girls? And where are there persistent gaps and challenges still? What, why is it so hard to connect the great work of many nonprofits with rigorous evidence? And why do we as funders continue struggling to understand what is best to fund? Where should we be seeking to scale up strong evidence-based programs? And where should we fund new innovative approaches? And we figured if we're struggling with a lot of these questions and understanding them, perhaps other key stakeholders are too that are working in the gender and education sector. And what evidence and impact are we all seeing that maybe others are, are um, challenged with or how can we share better? And so with that, we decided to really help create a resource for the whole community so we can learn and share together. The goal of understanding the creation of this open and accessible database for key stakeholders in the gender and education sector globally, as well as a systematic review of the evidence to help really drive two things. First, to drive more focus on smarter investments and better evidence-based programming. And second, to build new collaborations and partnerships to drive implementation and progress forward. So that's what we're hoping the goals of, of Eager can help with. We at Akidna Giving are really still in a learning journey. Not so much about why does gender and education, why is it important? We think we all know and agree on the why, but really about how to best use education as a strategy to support boys and girls. So with that, I will hand it over to Stephanie and her team to share more about Eager. Great, thank you so much, Erin. And I want to just um, echo Erin in thanking all of you for joining us today, especially in such difficult circumstances for so many around the world. As Erin said, we're hopeful that this resource can 
help to bring our community together at a time when we can't be together in the same space. So as Erin also mentioned, this work has been led by the Girl Center, which is a global hub of research and thought leadership that generates, synthesizes, and translates evidence to ensure that investments in adolescents and young people, especially girls, are based on rigorous evidence. And although the Girl Center focuses on adolescent girls, this resource is broader. It includes information relevant to girls and boys from early childhood to early adulthood. So the work of the Girl Center is focused on expanding opportunities. And a key part of that work is making sure that young people have access to high quality education. As you all know, of course, there has been enormous progress in expanding access to school and in achieving gender equality in education globally. As of 2015, UNESCO declared that gender parity had been achieved in primary and secondary attainment around the world. But as you also know, in many places, gender gaps remain and progress in attainment has stagnated. Levels of literacy and numeracy are very low, even among young people who attend primary school. And new barriers are emerging. According to UNESCO, school closures in response to COVID-19 are affecting more than 90% of the student population globally. In different ways, we're all working to address these remaining barriers to progress in global education. And the goal of EAGER is to help all of us to do that work more effectively. So we would love to hear from you about the biggest challenges that you're facing in your work. As a reminder, you can go to menti.com and enter the six-digit code on the screen here to let us know. So in the meantime, while you're entering that information, I'll tell you a little bit about how we're thinking about the problems that face our community. And this is based on many conversations that we've had with all of you over the last few years. What we've heard is that funders want to know how to make the best investments with the greatest impact, especially when there are so many barriers left to tackle. Both researchers and those implementing programs on the ground find it challenging to know who is doing what, where, and what the evidence tells us about what works and for whom. And linked with this, policymakers want data that tell them where the problems are greatest and what the best solutions are to address those problems. So taken together, what we've heard is that there's a lack of coordination and communication among these groups. So let's go back and hear about the, the biggest challenges that you face in your work. OK, so it looks like you perceive all of these to be challenges in your work as well, and that's consistent with what we've heard. But the leading challenges here look like they're finding funding and finding evidence of what works. And, and that links back to, to what I was mentioning earlier, which is that funders are also finding it challenging to make sure that their investments are focused on what works. So we're thrilled to share this resource with you that can help bridge some of these divides. OK. So what we're hoping is that EAGER can help be a part of the solution. The goal is to foster connections between organizations and programs and to help identify where needs are greatest, to curate evidence about what works for whom, and to drive smarter investments. So all of us on this webinar are committed to expanding opportunities for young people around the world. And while we know, of course, that no single website can do that on its own, we believe that EAGER is a critical step on our shared journey to achieving that goal together. So you're probably anxious to just see what's in this website if you haven't had a chance to look through it on your own yet. And I will hand it over to my colleague, Meredith, in just a minute to walk you through the site itself. But first, I want to quickly give an overview of the information that's included. We've focused initially on low- and middle-income countries. And we're approaching this from the perspective of three core pillars of information, where the needs are greatest, what is current practice, and what is the evidence of what works. So first, we've included information on where the gender and education needs are greatest, drawing largely on sustainable, sustainable development goal indicators. We have also mapped who is doing what and where in global and gender and education, and to do that, We've initially focused on organizations that meet three criteria. The first is that they work in more than one country. The second is that they have an annual operating budget of about 1 million US dollars. 
And the third is that they work to address gender and education, which we've defined broadly to capture any work that might help address gender-related barriers to education, including practices like child marriage. So the third pillar of information in EAGER is evidence of what works. And the evidence comes from both existing literature as well as the new systematic review that we're finalizing right now. So how do we know what works? We could spend the full hour discussing our approach to evidence, but let me just summarize it very briefly here. In terms of existing evidence, we're pulling in results from recent systematic reviews and rating the strength of evidence for each approach and outcome pair. So for example, does teacher training work to improve literacy? We're also addressing a gap in the evidence through a new systematic review that's looking specifically at interventions designed to address gender-related barriers to schooling. The full results from that review should be out in the coming months, but we're sharing preliminary findings through the site between now and then. So in both cases, the existing evidence and the new evidence, we tried to maintain rigorous standards, which means that <clears throat> results from individual studies or the gray literature are not fully represented here yet, but we're looking forward to continuing to expand on the evidence included in the coming months and years. So before turning over to Meredith to do the live demo, I just want to ask one more question. And again, you can share your responses on mentee.com. And that is, what are the most common gender-related barriers to education in the settings where you work? So while you're entering those responses, I'll just tell you a little bit about how we're thinking about this. In designing our systematic review, we had to put together a list of gender-related barriers. <clears throat> And much of this thinking has come from the work of your organization. So we're thinking about perceived barriers in terms of how they impact three broad levels, the community, the school, and the household. For example, child marriage might be a gender-related barrier at the community level, a gender-insensitive curriculum might be a barrier at the school level, and financial constraints might be a barrier at the household level. And of course, in reality, these barriers are all closely connected, as are these different levels. So let's go back and take a look at what you all have shared in terms of the barriers that you face in your work. So interestingly, there are a couple that are emerging pretty clearly. Um, one is child marriage, and, and the other is lack of support for girls' education. Um, and of course, these are these are closely related in a lot of ways. Um, another another couple that are emerging, and it's great to see the different answers coming in, are financial constraints, gender insensitive school environments, and inadequate life skills. Um, so it's fascinating. Please keep sharing your, this information. We'd love to hear more about the challenges you're facing. So I'm happy to turn it over now to my colleague Meredith who will walk you through the live site so you can continue to explore on your own. As you explore the site, please keep in mind that it's live, but it is also a work in progress. We wanted to soft launch the site to give you all a chance to interact with it and share feedback. And we've gotten some amazing feedback in the last month since we originally launched it. But we also are continuing to add data and fix bugs here and there. So with your input, we look forward to a full launch this fall, along with a gender and education roadmap, which Erin will talk a little bit about later. So with that, I am happy to hand it over to Meredith. Thanks, Stephanie. If you'd like to follow along in our live demonstration, please feel free to, excuse me, just a moment. Um, please feel free to enter the URL um, on your screen, which will be coming soon. Um, www.eagerresource.org into your internet browser and you can follow along in our live demonstration. Great. So before I jump into sharing my screen, um, if you'd like to take a minute just to pass that along um, and head to the website, we'll get started in the live demonstration in just a moment. Great, I hope everyone has made it here. 
Welcome everyone to Eager. As Stephanie mentioned, this resource brings three different kinds of data together to provide a 360 degree view of the gender and education space. Eager is composed of three distinct yet interconnected parts, the profiles, the data visualizations, and the evidence to practice tool. But to get to know the resource better, let's start with the building blocks of Eager, the profiles. Users can find details on over 250 organizations and 500 programs that are currently active in the gender and education space. We are always adding new profiles, so check back often. You can peruse the list of profiles here or search for a specific organization to find out more. The organizational profiles provide general information regarding who this organization is in the gender and education space. That green check mark next to the organization name means that the information has been verified by the organization itself. If there is no check mark, the profile contains data we've extracted from publicly available websites and materials. From the organizational profile, a user can get a better sense of this organization's areas of work. Any partners or funders an organization may collaborate with background information on this organization, as well as any current girls' education activities this organization may be affiliated with. If you'd like to explore a particular program further, click on any of the projects listed here to view their program profile. As you can see, similar to the organization profiles, users can find details on a specific gender and education program, including what topics the program addresses, who the program is targeted towards, and what approaches are being used to reach this program's particular program goals. But let's say you'd like to explore what's happening in the gender and education space from a bird's eye view. Head to our data visualizations page to explore who's doing what and where through our table and map visualization. Choose the table builder to get a curated list of organizations and programs. If you know what you're looking for, you can create your own table by selecting the parameters you'd like to filter by and the columns you'd like to display. Or if you'd like to simply explore the database, select one of our preset table questions on the left. And voila, your table is generated. You can always refine or expand your table by using the adjust results menu on the right hand side of your screen. In the future, users will be able to download their results into an Excel or CSV file. While the table provides a great way to explore who's doing what in the gender and education space, perhaps you're more interested in where these activities are taking place and, where they're, and how that compares to needs on the ground. That's where the map visualization comes in handy. Similar to the table, the map builder allows you to explore a preset map or create your own by filtering programs based on the parameters you set. You can also shade your map based on select needs indicators, which use sustainable development indicator data. And create your map. Once your map is generated, you can explore programs taking place at the country, region, or global level. Each program on the map is represented using a small marker. The green circles with the numbers in the middle are consolidated program markers for programs taking place at the country level. Click on any of the program markers to get more information, as well as a link to this, pro this program profile. You can also check out programs taking place at the global level by clicking on this blue circle here, or look at regional level programs represented by the purple circles. The last element of Eager is the evidence to practice tool. This tool takes research evidence from diverse disciplines and distills complex results into simple-to-use messages on what works in gender and education. In this tool, you can explore which approaches are most effective to achieve a specific outcome, or if you're already using a specific approach and you'd like to see which outcomes that approach affects, you can search outcomes. So say we want to know what approaches work to improve girls' literacy. You can select Lit increased literacy from the drop-down menu here and view your results. 
Eager then shows the list of hypothesized approaches, as well as the level of evidence for an association between each one of these approaches and our selected outcome. It also reveals where data are available and the level of evidence desegregated for girls and for boys. Expanding a row provides links to the research that the evidence is drawn from. You can click on any of the research tiles to see a summary of a particular study. To learn more about Eager, head to our About page. Here you can learn more about the different aspects of the website and how Eager was created. To get regular Eager updates, head to our Join Us page, where you can join our mailing list and let us know what programs, profiles, and organization profiles you'd like to see. We're also eager to hear from you, so send us suggestions on how we can make this the most useful resource for the gender and education community. And with that, I'd like to hand it off to my colleague, Nicole Haberlin, who will share some of our findings from using Eager. Thanks so much, Meredith. Hello, everyone. Um, before we explore Eager further, I just wanted to say to everyone who has joined us on this webinar today that one of the most rewarding things about this project has been learning about the amazing work that you all have underway. So while we will continue to expand the database of programs and evidence that underlie Eager, there's enough data entered to start seeing the emerging contours of the gender and education field. The field is organic and it will undoubtedly continue to grow and shift and Eager itself is dynamic and will reflect those changes. But let's see what's emerging now. Using the Venn diagram Stephanie introduced as a frame, let's take a look at the alignment and synergies as well as gaps and disconnects between needs, practice, and evidence. So this is the Eager map of current programs that focus on school-related gender-based violence or SRGPB. If we're going to invest more in this work, we need to know what programs are out there, who is implementing them and where, what types of programs have demonstrated effects, not just on reducing violence, which is important in and of itself, but also improving education outcomes, what are the evidence gaps, where would investments in research and evaluation be best directed, and Eager can help us explore all those questions. So this is a table of SRGBV programs generated with Eager with columns selected to display the program name, program type, lead organization, and countries in which the program is active. A quick query in Eager shows us that there are quite a large number of organizations working on SRGBV. There are 90 current programs, including 59 projects, 10 funding streams, 12 studies, and six advocacy campaigns directed at school violence. Yet, there's a major evidence gap in terms of what SRGBV programs work to improve education outcomes. The evidence for the pervasiveness, pervasiveness of school violence and how to reduce school violence has been growing in recent years, but those evaluations rarely look at the effects on education, and it's an important missing piece. This type of information is incredibly useful, as you know, for strategic planning, investment decisions, responding to RFAs, and more. Now let's use the Venn diagram to explore an activity in terms of alignment across all three domains. So conditional cash transfers, or CCTs, individuals and households have promising or effective evidence rankings for a number of education outcomes. Not all outcomes, but quite a few, um, including increased enrollment in primary school and reduced absenteeism. CCTs to individuals, next slide please. CCTs to individuals have also been shown to be promising for progression to secondary school. But in Sub-Saharan Africa, where the rates of progression are among the lowest in the world, of the 19 programs that include a focus on the primary to secondary transition, only one uses CCTs. So evidence and need are aligned, but practice is not. This is not to say that all programs should only use CCTs. If we did that, we'd never innovate new effective interventions. But it is obviously a critical consideration, especially when thinking about replication and scale up. Again, these observations of gaps and alignments are preliminary and may shift as more programs and studies come online and Eager's database expands. But there's enough already logged to get a sense of the state of the field, its promise, and its gaps. Now last, um, while there's a growing body of evidence to draw on, there are also challenges for us in distilling it. <laughs> 
as Stephanie mentioned, um, we are currently conducting a systematic review of gender-related barriers to education. And many, almost half, of the interventions being evaluated are multi-component. That means that they include more than one program element that aims to improve outcomes for girls. So, for example, instead of just implementing a life skills curriculum on gender equality, the program also provides savings accounts for something like that. Shahini and Manjula will touch on the importance of multi-component programs as well. Um, however, if we look more closely at these interventions, we can see how complicated it becomes to draw lessons. Here's a subsample of the six studies in the review that all include a safe spaces component. Many of them also include life skills, and of course what those life skills curricula contain also varies. Many, but not all, include female mentors, some also include financial literacy, one also includes free lunch, <laughs> and so on. So how do we know which component is driving the impact on outcome? Or is it the specific combination of components and their synergies that drive impact? Without designing the evaluation in a, in a way that tests one variation of components with another variation of components, or a sim single component version with a multi-component version, we just don't know. <laughs> This is another research need that Eager is highlighting. So I hope you all have fun exploring Eager. And with that, I'm delighted to pass it on to Shohini from Breakthrough. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Shohini, I'm the CEO and President of Breakthrough. Um, and can we go on to the slide on Breakthrough, please? Um, so Breakthrough uh, has been working for the last 20 years to make violence against women and girls unacceptable. You can read all of that, so I'm not going to you know, waste my very small time uh, talking about the organization so much uh, rather than talking about the research. Um, one of the things that I want to mention is that when we saw child marriage as one of the barriers to girls' education, it goes a little bit deeper down than that. So our work uh, actually focuses on the norms that actually pro prohibits girls from going into education and enables child marriage, right? Um, so we have three pillars to our work. One is a 360-degree campaign, which is our oldest strategy, you know, very relevant multimedia campaigns with strong on-ground components, which builds a movement around violence against women and girls by engaging every citizen on the issue. We have a deep transformation model, which is across the 15 districts where we are currently in. Uh, 1,200 government schools where we demonstrate the shift in social norms through deep engagement. And we ground it on a social ecological model that builds a movement from me to me. So, you know, we start with an individual, you look at the family, the community, and finally the institution. In this case, it's a school. We scale up what works by sharing the evidence with larger collectives like the eager, other organizations, governments, both inside and outside of India. So the deep transformation model, which also, you know, uh, enables child marriage, it actively examines questions and helps to change rigid gender norms, you know, and imbalances of power. So it's, it's very interconnected. If you look at power dynamics in relationships, if you look at gender and sexual norms and values, and you look at women and girls' empowerment and engagement of men and boys, these are all connected in our work. And this is used to address the harmful norms and cultures that do not allow women and girls to reach their full potential or enable child marriage or inhibits their access to you know, higher education. Uh, in India, you know, girls between the age of 14 and 18, 50% of them are almost out of school. And a lot of that is actually because of the harmful gender norms and practices. So when we enter a geography, we focus on the relevant issue in that geography. So if it's in Jharkhand and Bihar, we'll focus on early marriage. If it's in Haryana, we'll focus on gender bias, sex selection, sexual harassment if we are in Delhi. And we encourage critical awareness of gender roles and norms and building agency of women and girls to raise these questions. So, and, you know, coupled with that, engaging men and boys so that they can become an integral part of the solutions allies, you know. And recognizing the harmful pressures of patri patriarchal norms on them, they are not free from those at all. And then together with the community, family, governments, questioning the cost of this harmful inequitable gender norms in relation to adolescents' education and health outcomes. 
So directly sometimes through convergence dialogues and you know, consistent conversations and sometimes indirectly through media campaigns to build a greater gender sensitivity and reduced acceptance of violence against women and girls. Um, can I have the next slide please? So as an organization working on gender norm change, especially in the area of violence, uh, can I have the next slide please? Especially in the area of violence, you know, you often feel very alone. Since not too many organizations work on this, not too many strategies are available, and plus it is a very slow process. So eager actually gives us an opportunity to quickly identify partners in this space, read about you know, diverse strategies, find potential partners, and to inform our advocacy work, maybe with other partners globally. So I will use the uh, Eager's table data visualize, visualization to find you know, how many programs are there addressing social and gender norms. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, hi, can I have the next slide, please? Ah, thank you so much. Uh -huh. so, um, so, you know, if you look at that, the, uh, the kind of, uh, kind of you know, gender and social norms that inhibit girls access to school and, uh, and, 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 and school at this point of time education, we'll find that there are 87 organizations that address social norms. Um, 174 current programs that include 109 projects and you know about 21 advocacy campaigns and 15 funding initiatives and 21 studies. What does the evidence say? Can I have the next slide please? The evidence says that harmful and restrictive gender norms underlie a host of adverse outcomes including you know child marriage, sex selective abortion, girls access to you know beyond secondary education, uh, breakthroughs own RCT on gender norms change across a sample size of 15,000 adolescents across 314 government schools show that significant behavior and attitude change was possible after two and a half years of vigorous intervention. But we were not able to move the needle much on education. So efforts to change gender norms not always affect education outcomes. Our effort is here. It's not robust. Yet. It's robust, but it's not yet backed by rigorous evidence. As of yet, the effects of social change on education outcomes is not really very well known, and more research is needed in this. I'd like to talk about our you know, experience when actually moving the education needle. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so I, uh, you know, since evidence on gender norms is rare and not robust all the time, we are conscious about building a body of evidence on the key levers to achieve transformation. I spoke about the RCT on reshaping gender attitudes, gender equitable attitudes and behaviors among boys and girls, ethics that persisted years later at the second follow-up. We are now partnering with JPL for a long-term follow-up to see whether the same behaviors persist for the boys and girls who were 11, 12, 13, 14 when we did this program with them when they're 18, 19 and 20 and I uh, know we are expecting some interesting results. However, no adverse impact on, uh, on education outcomes, though, you know, despite displacing academic subjects, but no beneficial outcomes here. Interestingly, another randomized control trial of our program to prevent early marriage in Jharkhand and Bihar over a five years period, you know, showed very interesting results. So we had definite elements, uh, uh, definite elements with the program, which was, uh, definite elements with the program, which was, you know, one of them was just media campaign. One of them was media campaign plus training plus, you know, dialogue in the community plus, you know, working with and, and the other one was just, you know, just training. So a full component with everything, 360 degree uh, kind of a focus, one with media campaign, one with training. Now, there are many improvements on gender norms, but looking at the education outcomes, in some of the single component arms, the movement was not much. But in the multi-component arm, it had large effect on both education indicators. One was that 
that schooling for girls increased by 8.7 months, significantly more the control, which is, I think, 1.6 months only in one of the single com components. And significantly higher percentage of girls were more likely to remain in school than the control group. So I think the control group was 17% while uh, treatment was around 89%. So a huge, huge difference. So, and single component arms really had weaker or no effects. So the mass media campaign only arm did not have a significant effect on percentage of girls enrolled and only increased months of school by 1.6 months, not significantly different than the control group. So a diversified uh, 360 kind of an approach working with multi-stakeholder over a long period of time actually gave us really, really good results to look forward to. So I will stop now and I'll hand it back over to Stephanie uh, yeah. to introduce Manjula. Yeah. Thank you so much, Shahini. It's great to see the results from that RCT and, and to be able to integrate that evidence into the platform we're building. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Manjula to share more about her work. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and hello to all of you from Delhi. The Children's Investment Fund Foundation, or CIF, is the world's largest independent philanthropy dedicated to children's issues. We exist to work on the toughest problems facing children, and these are those that are technically challenging or politically complicated, or as is usually the case, both. We were set up because the cause of children and adolescents is ignored by many, and that is mostly because their voices are too soft and their arms are too weak to make societies and governments and the development organizations prioritize them. World Capital, which is what I lead and what, what we call our effort to empower girls and young women through education, skills, and income, is a perfect example of under-resourced, under-prioritized, technically and politically complex area. This is a strategy that we launched last year, but the genesis of this was 15 years in the making. We have been on this quest for Silver Bullet, a therapeutic food to address malnutrition, a contraceptive choices for newly wed women, a safe birth checklist to reduce maternal mortality. All of these are important but rarely address the root cause. A Eureka moment came in when we understood that there was a fundamental power imbalance at the family community level against girls. Unless we address that, we would never be able to effect change a big enough or a fast enough. What does this empowerment look like? Simple. If the girl had a chance to earn income, it would make others view them as assets rather than liability. Hence the name girl capital. The way this was going to be achieved was through education, skills, and income. Similar to Erin, my main goal is how to maximize the long-term impact of every dollar of precious philanthropic money, but existing evidence does not have all the answers. As Stephanie said, Eager is finishing a systematic review of education-related interventions for girls and have identified policy, household, school, and community barriers. The shading on this slide shows where evidence is compelling. You will notice why gaps remain. Twice as many studies have tested school-related costs rather than returns to schooling, when one of the reasons girls don't complete secondary is because they don't see a potential income after that. Four times as many studies have looked at support for girls' education than those that address child marriage when we know they are linked. My point is, Eager brings out the blind spot and we should use it to open our eyes. So there are two main reasons why I'm personally so excited about the Eager launch. Firstly, our evidence reviews re revealed that there were no individual magic wands for girl capital. It was all about combinations. Providing technical skills is not enough. It is essential to provide life skills too. Cash transfers on their own do not work to prevent child marriage. Scholarships for secondary school work far more effectively. I have a vision of Eager becoming the world's best treasure chest for this evidence and for us a community to share and learn from each other. Combinations of programs make life difficult, but one has to find perfect mix of them. And Eager, Eager can be our magic recipe builder. I know that my team and I have already started hungrily devouring 
the content as we inform our plans and design our portfolio. The second way I'm going to be using this resource is the advocacy tool. As a community, we desperately need to get the word out to the world about what works and what does, doesn't to inform, influence, and inspire government priorities and policies, evidence-based funding and programming, social norm change in the community, and so on. We should challenge ourselves to communicate the evidence we have, otherwise it remains constricted in our own little bubble. We need to welcome journalists and politicians and policy wonk people. We also need to be actively sharing content from here with them in the form of infographics and two-page policy briefs and white label report summaries. Finally, I do want to leave you with this image from the classroom in Rajasthan. Can you have the last slide, please? Thank you. Look at the life in the eyes of girls who have a chance at secondary school. That is what is it is all about. We have it within ourselves to give millions a chance for dream. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Manjula and Chohini. It is really wonderful to have you join us, and we're thrilled with the enthusiasm you have for Eager, and we hope that it's a valuable shared resource for all of us. Um, so now that you've all had a chance to preview Eager, we hope that you can see how it can be a resource um, for the whole gender and education community. And most importantly, we hope that you will join us in being involved in Eager. For Eager to really be a, you know, an action-oriented resource that we intend it to be, it's, it, we have to have the most up-to-date and useful information on the, on the community, and we need to be able to sh be sure that the community is aware of it. So we genuinely want to know how we can make it more useful for you. So once you've had a chance to explore the Eager website and dive into it, um, we hope that you can add or update your organizational or program's information if you're already using Eager. Um, we have the following links in here um, for you to be able to do that. Um, and if you have feedback or suggestions, we, we genuinely welcome them. Um, or if you have ideas on organizations or programs to add, um, please reach out on the uh, email address here. And we hope that you can also uh, think about people in your network um, to share this resource far and wide with. This is just a first introduction of Eager. It's a living resource, as we've been saying throughout the webinar, um, that will be updated with information about ongoing programs continuously. We want all of you to know that we're very committed to the kid to giving to continue to support Eager as long as the educational field really uses it and finds it valuable. So your investment and time in contributing to Eager and helping share your feedback is one we're really committed to taking seriously and helping it support this and sustain this great uh, resource for all of us. And as I think evidenced by the participation of our panelists and information in Eager, um, that from donors and partners, so many of us are committed to this resource. So please share your thoughts and feedback. So now what's coming next? Well, the POP Council team will share new data visualizations in the coming months. They are also working on a roadmap for the gender and education field that will be coming in the fall of 2020, around October, which will pull together some of the most important findings from this work and share recommendations with the community. This is really just a preview today that we've been showing you, and so we'd welcome your thoughts, again, on, on areas that you'd like us to dive in more to. Um, but we do hope to share more of those recommendations coming in the fall. And we will host um, you know, more ongoing interactions um, in the coming you know, weeks and months um, through newsletters and other resources um, that will help be, be able to add um, to the widening community behind Eager. As Stephanie mentioned, you know, Eager may be a website, but if we all pay, take part in it and collaborate to make it as helpful as possible, it can also be something more. It can be a critical step on our way to ushering in a new and better future for girls and boys around the world. So please join us. As we open uh, the Q&A for the audience, we'd like to ask for your feedback one more time. Um, if you can go to the mentee.com um, website with the code again, 996418. The question is, can you share your reaction to Eager in one word? We'd love to hear from the community on this call but your reaction to Eager in one word. And while you're sharing your reactions, we'll um, watch the word cloud form, and I'll turn it over uh, back to Jennifer to remind the audience on how to ask questions. Great. Thanks, Erin. Um, 
you can simply type, we've received a handful of questions, so you can simply type your question into the Q&A uh, field at the bottom right of your screen. And it looks like we've got about 14 minutes or so to um, go through the many questions that we've received from you all. So uh, thanks for submitting. And um, I think the, the word cloud should be forming. Uh, so Isabel, if you could share uh, your screen. Uh, so we can all have a look at the word cloud as we go through the Q&A. Um, all right, so one of the first questions that we have in is, um, here's a good question. How do you choose the criteria uh, for which organizations can be included on the site? So let's hand that over sure. to Stephanie. Are you, okay, great. Sure. Yeah, I'm here. Um, thanks. So thanks again, everyone, for for joining um, and for all these questions. Uh, so we really see this as kind of our starting point for the site. Um, we needed to pick a scope that was somewhat manageable to be very transparent about it. And so we um, were looking for larger organizations that tend to have a bigger um, amount of their work on education, in part because it's easier for us to get that information from organizations' websites um, and to spend a lot of effort mapping it um, from, from, our, from our side. And so I think where we're hoping to go in the future is expanding to include more and more organizations in partnership with all of you. So um, even if you don't meet those criteria that we've laid out for our initial inclusion criteria, we would love to hear from you and we'd love to think about ways to include the work of your organization on the site, um, and we're continuing to think about ways to expand, including partnering with organizations that work nationally or regionally to make sure that we're not missing any important work on the ground. Great. Uh, another question coming in, this one is from Meredith. Um, how can we add our organization on Eager, and can we recommend other organizations we know about? Thanks, Jennifer. Yes, you can definitely add your information on Eager, and we would always love to hear and get your suggestions on other organizations that may not be currently included in the web portal itself. Uh, to do that, please reach out to us currently on eger at popcouncil.org to suggest organizations, and also um, we'd be happy to send you the materials to either add your work or edit your, work, uh, your profiles if you're already included within Eager. Um, we are also hopefully integrating um, that system within the website itself on our Join Us page, so stay tuned for that where you can log into the website and update it on your own in the next few days. Thanks. Uh, another question, uh, this one can be for Stephanie um, and Erin. Uh, between funders, policymakers, practitioners, and researchers, uh, the question is, are communities a missing stakeholder in Eager? Yeah, that's, I think that's a great question. Um, so the way, that we, the way that we are conceptualizing this work, um, as I was talking a bit in the beginning, is, is for it to be a resource for organizations like yourselves that are working with those communities. So um, certainly we, we, as Aaron said, we're thinking about how to expand it and make it as useful and relevant as possible and would be very open to hearing your thoughts on how to make it a resource for communities themselves. Um, I think initially we were imagining that it's for these organizations. And again, we started with these kind of bigger global organizations in terms of an initial audience, um, but, but thinking of lots of different ways that we can expand it and certainly ultimately want it to be a resource that is beneficial to those communities. Um, so I would love any thoughts from you on how we can do that more effectively. Erin, do you have any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I think we're definitely very committed to, um, you know, wanting to have uh, more national, you know, country level deeper dives. Um, it's, it is something, you know, I, th I think as you can all imagine to, to get to that level of mapping um, where we've started, you know, in here with, you know, two states in India and um, Kenya, it takes an, a lot more time and detail to get to reach out to the smaller organizations and be able to verify information. So um, we you know, have engaged with a, um, a few other funders now that we're hopefully will be able to join us to help support Eager and build a, a vibrant community up behind sustainment that allows us to get to that country level. And I think through some of that and looking at the richness of, um, of 
local actors, if you will, um, by country, you will get um, a better sense of that community level. But it is um, sort of, a, as Stephanie is saying, a goal that we're striving for and hope to work towards. Great. Thank you. Uh, and we've got a couple more minutes left for questions. So as a reminder, please submit through the Q&A uh, function at the bottom right of your screen. Another that did come through, um, I think this could be for Nicole, Stephanie, or you, Erin. Uh, will COVID-19 economic impact and recession further worsen girls' access to education, skills, and jobs? Oh, it's a big question. I'll I'll start <laughs> and then um, <laughs> and then see if Nicole or Aaron, you have anything to add. Um, I mean, I think it's undeniable that that COVID nineteen is um, having all sorts of clear immediate impacts and also probably longer term impacts that it's difficult for us to even anticipate at this point. I mean, I mentioned in the beginning that um, more than ninety percent of of school-age young people are experiencing disruptions right now because of COVID-19. And I think we all know um, in our work how, um, how, the, how the long-term impacts of that can play out, um, often especially for girls who uh, might miss school temporarily and then, you know, get married or um, get pregnant or, you know, be removed from that, that longer-term opportunity um, for, for the rest of their lives. So, um, I, we, it's something that we have been thinking about quite a bit, and um, I'll say our, our office in India, um, as well as a number of our other offices, have been doing some amazing work collecting data to try to understand the longer-term impacts. Um, and, and so, yeah, we would love to, to hear from you about it and keep thinking about it together. Um, yeah, I wonder if um, Shohini or Manjula, you might have other thoughts on that question or, or perspectives of what you're seeing in your work. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to highlight always, and I always like to do that, is that um, very often uh, we need to actually prepare both our communities and our, you know, girls and boys, uh, you know, the to be able to work. You know, it's not always whether there are jobs, whether there are, you know, employment opportunities, but very often, you know, the social um, norms to prevent women and girls from going out to do things that they want to do. And so that is, again, something that I'm going to bring back to social norms and say we have to also address those kind of issues before we, you know, jump and say, yes, you know, from education to employment is a good step, but there are many uh, barriers to that. Great. Uh, if there's not anything else to add, we've got, I think, uh, one or two more questions coming in. Um, so this question is uh, really open to any of the panelists to um, answer. The question is, based on your impressive data resources, what is your advice on the minimum length of time it might take <laughs> to shift entrenched gender norms? <laughs> it's a tough one, too. Oh boy, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, pass that one over as well to to Shohini and Manjula and see if you at least would like to take a first um, give a first answer to that since you're you're working to address these issues on the ground. Um, to our experience, we've seen that it takes at least anything between five to six years of very intensive work with a, with a community to actually be able to shift those gender norms. Uh, attitudes and behaviors might be a little easier. So with our RCT, we found that after two and a half years of intervention, we could shift both attitudes and behaviors. Our work on early marriage with the RCT there, we found that community, and especially, you know, community normative, normative behavior at community level takes at least five to six years to be able to shift it. And, and really, if you want to really see results, it has to be a long-term kind of, it's a long haul. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I echo uh, Sohini, and I think mindset shift is something that we need to take a longer term view. Uh, and I think what is going to be critical is to look at what kind of impact that you're looking at. So if it's about 
getting girls into schools, there is one way that we need to approach the social norms and it's very much about uh, shifting the minds, uh, minds of not just the parents in the communities but also girls themselves because often girls themselves because they don't have those aspirations, they also don't see a pathway for uh, themselves going for, you know, uh, completing their secondary education. So I think uh, it's very important have a long-term view, but also start looking at milestones that would help us reach there. Us, the way we are looking at those milestones are around five key actions that we have defined uh, for ourselves, which is around education, uh, life skills, vocational technical skills, and income generation, and affirmative action. And what we believe is that social norms is going to be the foundation or actually overall uh, umbrella for the kind of work that we do. Uh, but it definitely has to be a long-term uh, horizon that one needs to take. Yeah. Great. I think we have uh, time for one last question before I hand it over to Aaron to wrap up. But uh, the last question is, um, this is probably for Stephanie and Nicole. How did you decide what works to um, improve gender equality in education? Oh, um, so we we definitely have not decided. Um, we are trying to take in the evidence that has been produced by other researchers to show what works to improve gender equality in education. And so um, we're 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 taking in that evidence. We're seeing whether there are lessons that can be drawn out. Um, and so we used pretty rigorous criteria. What we did decide is which studies we would include in our review. Um, and those are all laid out in our protocol, which is published online, um, and you can also find it through the EGER website. Um, so the results will be coming out in the fall, but um, I think the biggest challenge that we're facing, which Nicole talked a little bit about before, is that it's very difficult to compare. So there are these amazing programs happening in all different places that have many different components, and it's difficult to compare them. Um, to each other and to draw out some clear lessons. So I think that's going to be a real takeaway in terms of where we need to produce evidence as a field going forward. But we will also have some, some concrete lessons learned and sort of directions um, in, in the fall, as, as Erin mentioned. Um, so with that, I know we're coming to the end of our time. Maybe I will just hand it back to Erin to, to wrap things up for us. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you for everyone for your great participation and questions. It's wonderful to hear all the Q&A as well as um, all the participation on menti.com. And a special thanks to all of our presenters for joining us today. Um, we really do want to hear more. If your question wasn't answered or if you have other feedback, um, please follow up with an email um, or the join us um, page on eager.com. We'll provide you an email address and a link for those uh, comments. So we have one final question on menti.com for you to share your feedback and thoughts here as well. Um, so please uh, feel free to provide any feedback that would be useful um, for all, all of us as we continue to support Eager. We look forward to hearing from all of you and really to continue to working together to drive progress in education, since we really believe at a kidney giving that as all children learn equally, the world becomes more equal too. So thanks for joining us today. Um, goodbye, be safe, be well. Um, and this is the end of our event.